Hello everybody, welcome to a new episode of The Dissenter. I'm your host, Ricardo Lopes, and today I'm joined by Dr. Mark Stonking. He directs the Human Population History Group in the Department of Evolutionary Genetics at the Max Planck Institute for Evolutionary Anthropology, and he is also Honorary Professor of Biological Anthropology at the University of Leipzig in Germany. Dr. Stonking's research uses molecular genetic approaches to address questions of anthropological interest concerning the origins, migrations, structure, and relationships of human populations, and those are the topics we're going to focus on today. So, Dr. Stone King, welcome to the show. It's a pleasure to everyone. Thank you. Okay, great. So, uh, I don't think I ever had a, an interview on evolutionary genetics on the show. So, could, we, could you start by telling us what evolutionary genetics is about and perhaps the kinds of questions it tries to answer. So the, the main idea behind evolutionary genetics is that we all carry a record of our past in our DNA. And that's because our DNA is inherited from our ancestors, right? I got my DNA from my mother and my father, who got their DNA from their mother and their father, and so on and so on. So we carry a record of our past in our DNA. And so by studying variation in DNA between individuals, we can understand something about how they are, were related in the, in the distant past, how their ancestors re were related. We can ask questions about how much variation, how much diversity there is within populations versus between populations, identify populations that are closely related, identify populations that uh, came into contact after they diverged in the past and so forth. Mm -hmm. And this has been also used to, to go just beyond population history, but also to study species relationships. So by studying um, appropriate regions of the DNA, we can identify who are nearest uh, living relatives and reconstruct entire evolutionary histories for living and now even extinct organisms. Mm -hmm. But DNA, we are talking about both nuclear DNA and mitochondrial DNA, right? That's correct, yes. All, all of the DNA that we have can be used for this, these sorts of studies. Mm -hmm. So, uh, could you tell us about the concept of the mitochondrial Eve that I think you introduced back in the 80s, right? Yeah, this was work we did, I did with when I was a graduate student in the laboratory of Alan Wilson with another graduate student, Rebecca Kahn. And so the idea, although it's caused a lot of confusion, is actually quite simple, given that there was a uh, single common origin of life on this planet, which is what is generally accepted, and that all living things today are descended from that single common origin, then it has to be the case that all of the variation in any segment of DNA that we look at has to trace back to a single ancestor who lived at some time in the past, in some place in the past. Now, what's special about mitochondrial DNA is that, you know, I just said that we get our DNA from our mothers and our fathers, but that's not true for mitochondrial DNA. Mitochondrial DNA you only get from your mother. So males have it but they don't transmit it to their offspring. So when we look at variation of mitochondrial DNA, we're looking at variation in the maternal, basically we're getting a record of the maternal history of populations. And if I compare the number of differences in my mitochondrial DNA to your mitochondrial DNA, that's a measure of how far back in the past you and I last shared a common maternal ancestor. So if there are very few differences, then we have a recent common ancestor. If there are a lot of differences, then we have a more remote common ancestor. But it has to be the case that all of the variation in mitochondrial DNAs in humans today has to trace back to a single common ancestor. So even though this is called mitochondrial Eve, and it was a single woman, she was not Eve in the biblical sense, and that she was the first um, woman. Um, she may have been an anatomically modern human, but she could also have been something else. There's nothing about this whole process of of, of tracing lineages back to a common ancestor that says anything about what species or what, that or what population that that uh, individual was. Nor was she the only woman alive at her time. She was a member of a population, and there would have been multiple populations around. But those individuals, their lineages ultimately went extinct. Their mitochondrial lineages, because either they're off, you know, some future generation. Um, their great-great-great-great-granddaughters didn't have offspring, or they had only male offspring. Mm 
And in either case, that individual's lineage now goes extinct. And so it's by this random process of extinction of mitochondrial lineages that you get that all of the lineages existing today trace back to a single ancestor who lived in the past. Mm -hmm. But I mean, this mitochondrial DNA allows for us to study our ancestry, but th does it interact in any way with the nuclear DNA? Do they influence one another or are they completely separate and participate in different cellular functions? So the mitochondrial DNA is, as the name uh, suggests, located in a different part of the cell. So our, our nuclear DNA is in the form of chromosomes is located in the nucleus. Mitochondrial DNA are located in the structures called mitochondria, which produce the energy for the cell. So they're very important um, for cells. But they also uh, have to interact quite intimately with the nuclear DNA because the mitochondrial DNA itself only encodes for 13 protein products. So all of the other several hundred proteins, and these are all uh, parts of the, the different uh, metabolic complexes that produce energy in the mitochondria. So all of the other parts of these complexes that produce energy, all of the structural parts of the mitochondria, all of the proteins, enzymes necessary to, to transcribe the mitochondrial DNA, make the RNA that makes the proteins, all of the proteins needed to replicate the mitochondrial DNA, those are all made in the nucleus, and then they have to get transported into the mitochondria for the mitochondria to function importantly. So there is a very tight coevolution between uh, mitochondrial DNA and the nuclear DNA. Mm -hmm. And in turn, mitochondrial DNA has been transferring genes over evolutionary time into the nuclear DNA. So the, the idea is that the mitochondria rep are, are, represent a, an endosymbiotic event that happened only roughly a billion years ago when uh, two single cellular organisms became conjoined together and then the mitochondria gradually transferred its genes and its functions to the nucleus to what became the nucleus so now there's only these 13 proteins that are left that are encoded by the mitochondria mm -hmm. so in terms of evolutionary genetics by studying nuclear and mitochondrial dna uh, do we answer different questions by studying each of them or... Uh, they're, better, they're better suited to different types of questions, but they also complement one another. Okay. So mitochondrial DNA, by being maternally inherited, it tells us something about the evolutionary history of females, but it doesn't tell us anything about the evolutionary history of males. In the nuclear DNA, as you know, there is, in addition to the chromosomes that we inherit from both parents, there's also one special chromosome called the Y chromosome that only comes from the male. So it's transmitted from fathers to sons. It's what makes us males male. And so by studying variation in the Y chromosome, we can learn something about the paternal history of human populations. And then we have all of the other chromosomes that, uh, encoded that are in the, the nucleus. And by studying them, we get insights into all of the other ancestors that contributed to our genome, right? Because if we're studying mitochondrial DNA, we're only learning about our great, 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 great grandmothers. We study the Y chromosome, we learn about our great, 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 great grandfathers. But we have lots of other ancestors who contributed uh, to our, our genomes today. And so by studying the other chromosomes, we learn about those as well. Mm -hmm. So in one of your papers, and now I'm going to quote you talking about mitochondrial DNA, you say that it can marry two different approaches. Uh, so I'm going to quote you now. One path is that of those who work far above the species level and were concerned with genealogical trees, time scales, and accumulation of new mutations and surviving molecular lineages. The other path is that of those who worked at and below the species level and were concerned mainly with population structure, migration, and the frequencies of alleles that existed in an ancestral population. Could you explain that? Yes, so this was uh, from a review paper that came out shortly after mitochondrial DNA studies first started being done. And the idea was that prior to the introduction of mitochondrial DNA, people who studied um, species evolution, molecular evolution at this, uh, uh, comparing different species, were using very different genetic markers than people who studied the uh, population history. So people who studied species relationships were largely sequencing uh, particular uh, uh, initially proteins and then ultimately genes that were of interest. Um, cytochrome C was a very popular one. So you would sequence the cytochrome C protein, infer the DNA sequence, and use that to build a phylogeny of different um, species. 
But you wouldn't want to do that study cytochrome C variation with, uh, uh, within humans because there's hardly any variation. You don't learn anything because pretty much everyone's the same. So for population his, uh, history studies, people uh, prior to mitochondrial DNA were relying on allozymes, so on um, variants of different uh, proteins, so blood groups, red cell enzymes, serum proteins, and things like that. And there was a whole industry that built up around these sorts of studies, uh, uh, studying genetic variation in all sorts of different organisms, not just humans. But it was based on allele frequency differences, so you measure the frequencies of different variants and that's your, your, your basis for comparison. So species level, you're looking at mutations that accumulate in a particular protein. Within populations, you're looking at allele frequency differences. Mitochondrial DNA then was the first real molecule that allowed you to bridge that gap because you could look at mutational differences among different humans. Mitochondrial DNA evolved the mutational differences fast enough that you would get, um, you could uh, it made sense to do those sorts of studies. So that's the idea there, that we can now take the, the methods of um, molecular evolution at the species level, main, namely building species phylogenies, and build a phylogeny for mitochondrial DNA model, uh, sequences, uh, uh, lineages within a population. So that was the new idea. Right. And by studying our evolutionary genetics, uh, when I say our, we, homo sapiens, is it already possible for us to give a definite answer to the question of if we evolved from a single population or from various different populations? That's, uh, <clears throat> so the, the, the short answer is no, we don't know the answer to that yet. That's an area of very intense uh, study. I think when we and others were originally working on the, the idea of a recent African origin of modern humans, we had the idea that there was a, a single population somewhere in Africa that transformed to become modern humans. Now it's becoming, uh, you know, there, there's uh, alternative views which I think are quite um, promising and are going in the direction of uh, different archaic populations in Africa evolved in different ways and then they came together and it's this whole constellation of things that evolved in different ways all across Africa that led to modern humanity arising. So whether it was single origin or you know uh, different populations contributing different aspects to this, um, that's still very much an open question in an area of active research. But even if there were various different populations, they all came from Africa. Yeah. As far as we can tell, yes. As far as we can tell, it was all all happening within Africa. Mm -hmm. So, can we also do we do we also already have a complete account of our migrations out of Africa? Do we know uh, when we started migrating out of Africa and perhaps uh, the path we followed? So those are both also open questions. So on the, the, the question of when, there is a very strong signal in our genomes of primarily a single migration that would have occurred somewhere around 50 to 70,000 years ago. Okay, so we see um, that all non-Africans went through a, a, a bottleneck, a reduction in population size compared to Africa. And that bottleneck seems to be shared by all non-African populations. It's not like they went through their, their different bottlenecks. So that seems to indicate a single exodus out of Africa. There's also a shared signal of um, interbreeding with Neanderthals in all non-Africans. And so that would imply that there was a population that left Africa, very quickly encountered Neanderthals, mixed with them, picked up some Neanderthal ancestry, and then kept on migrating across the rest of the old world and ultimately into the new world. In contrast to that, we also have increasing fossil and archaeological evidence for early modern humans being out of Africa well before 50 to 70,000 years ago. So at the moment, that's, that's uh, a puzzle. You know, why don't we see evidence of their ancestry? And there's some claims that maybe there is some of their ancestry in at least some modern populations today. There's also growing evidence of uh, contributions by modern humans before this 50 to 70,000 time period with Neanderthals. So they may have come out mixed with Neanderthals, contributed some of their ancestry to Neanderthals, and then went extinct, went back to Africa, we don't know. Um, it could be that 
there is a definite signal of their ancestry in modern human populations today, but we can't detect it because we don't have any ancient DNA from those populations. I mean, I think it's a very important lesson from the Neanderthal uh, story that prior to having the Neanderthal genome sequence, a very hotly debated area was, what, is there or is there not any non-African archaic ancestry like Neanderthal ancestry in modern humans today? All of the work showed there was a strong signal of a recent African origin all across our genome, but whether it was complete replacement of Neanderthals and other non-African archaic humans, or whether there was some, some assimilation, some admixture that went on, some interbreeding, um, that was not possible basically to um, resolve using only DNA from modern human populations. It took having the DNA directly from a Neanderthal fossil for us to be able to see, yes, we do have this small but definite contribution of Neanderthals in non-Africans. So maybe if we are ever able to get DNA from one of these, you know, pre-50 to 70,000 year early modern humans out of Africa, um, then maybe we'll be able to tell more, more um, definitively whether or not there's any contribution of their ancestry in modern human populations today. So that's the when question, the where question, which migration route did they go by? And again, yeah, I would say the answer is no, we don't really have any strong indication of how they left Africa. Um, people have argued for a route out through the Egypt. Um, people have argued for a route going further south across, say, southern Saudi Arabia and then into, into India. People have even suggested maybe across the Strait of Gibraltar. Um, and the answer is, uh, again, very equivocal. We, and I think there, it's going to be very difficult from modern DNA alone to tell what the actual route was, because we know that even in the 50 to 70,000 years since they left, um, people have been moving around so much and mixing so much and going back into Africa that um, trying to tease out this signal of the initial migration out of Africa from just from the DNA of modern people is probably not going to be feasible. It's probably going to take ancient DNA to, to maybe shed some light on this. Mm -hmm. But that's also currently problematic because uh, DNA uh, preserves very poorly in fossils, especially in hot, humid environments. And so trying to get, you know, uh, there's no site in Africa yet where we have DNA that's older than about 12 or 15,000 years old, right? And the prospects for that don't look so good. So um, we'll just have to see. What about some more recent migrations, like, for example, the migration to the Americas? Do we have more information about that? For more recent migrations, yes, we have much more information. So there we're able to make more precise determinations from uh, modern humans because there hasn't been so much time for things to, for other things to happen. Plus, there's a great deal of ancient DNA evidence now coming from the Americas that's also shedding light on this. So yes, the settlement of the Americas, the colonization of um, Oceania, uh, the spread of farming into the uh, Europe, Europe, the Bantu expansion across Africa, these are all you know, large-scale human migrations that we are able to get quite a bit of information from by using DNA from both modern and ancient human populations. Mm -hmm. So, with the evidence we have from, uh, in terms of genetic variability from different human populations that evolved in different places or, or, on the earth, uh, can we talk about races? Is race a scientific concept? So, part of the problem with race is tell me how you define race. Okay. So. <laughs> And, you know, there was, there was a very interesting paper by um, two anthropologists, Jeff Long and Rick Kittle, several years ago, where they put together several different definitions of race that were there in the literature. And you look at these definitions and you can say, okay, from these definitions, there's no way I could tell anyway whether or not there are human races because they're just too vague to really be able to use in any, you know, um, practical fashion to answer that question. So what people who claim that there is evidence for races in our genetics point to are studies that show that you can detect genetic differences between human populations, even populations that are fairly closely related, okay? Um, now I should hasten to add that this is in a background of extreme genetic similarity. All humans across the world are very extreme in their DNA, are very similar in their DNA, you know, 99.99%. 
similar. So when we talk about big genetic differences between populations or small genetic differences between populations, we're only talking about 0.01% of our DNA where the differences lie. But still, there are those, you know, who, who say we can use algorithms where we cluster popula you know, populations into different clusters, and we find that we can cluster them quite readily into a, you know, a set of African populations, a set of European, a set of East Asian, and so forth, and then, you know, New World populations. And so, therefore, we say that because we have these clusters, we can, um, therefore, these correspond to races. The problem with that approach, these approaches, is that they start by assuming that clusters exist. And if you start with the assumption that clusters exist, they try to tell you what's the best fit to the data, assuming that there are clusters. But whether or not there really are clusters, you can't answer with those sorts of approaches. They don't tell you whether, you know, there's no goodness of fit to tell you how well a model of clusters actually fits the data. And to my mind, it's a really, you know, it's a really hard question. It's hard to come up with a good definition. But to me, you know, if you try to, to, to stand back from this and look at it, you'd say, well, if if there were something like races among human populations, then in some sense there should be boxes that we should put these different populations in, right? We should be able to, to, to identify some sort of clusters, you know, objectively and say that this is a good fit. And so one way that's been used to do this <clears throat> is to look at uh, genetic differences between human populations versus geographic distances, okay? And it turns out that when you do this, independently of whether they're in the same continent or different continental regions, there's a very strong correlation between the geographic distance between two populations and their genetic distance. So basically, human genetic variation is distributed along a cline. And you go far apart to populations that are far apart on the cline, they have larger genetic differences. To populations that are closer together on the cline, they have smaller genetic differences. But there's no place where you can place borders right? It's just a, okay. a smooth climb where you'd say, okay, at this point, I would stop and say, these are different races. It's all just continuous, the variation. So it's, it's a bit trite, but a, a, a useful example is a rainbow, right? So we can identify discrete colors in a rainbow, like yellow and red and orange. But if you look at the whole, the rainbow as a whole, it's, it's a continuum, it's a gradient, right? So it's the same with human populations. So with, based on those sorts of studies, I would say that there is no strong evidence for any sort of racial organization of, of human genetic differences. Mm -hmm. But even if there was evidence for that with modern migrations and interbreeding between different human populations, I mean, would it still make sense to talk about that? Um, I think only in the sense of our, our genetic history, right? How things... Okay were at some time in the past. But yes, as you point out, I mean, we're, you know, we're in an era now of extreme global mobilization. And so whatever differences there are between populations are certainly becoming more, more and more blurred. Mm -hmm. Right. So can we use evolutionary genetics also to study uh, cultural evolution <laughs> and how different aspect, aspects of our culture evolved? Um, if you make the assumption that um, cultural traits can have biological consequences, then yes, you can use genetic studies to learn more about cultural mm -hmm. traits. And I think there is ample evidence that cultural, human cultural traits can have an impact on our genetic variation in our biological evolution. So there are a number of examples where a particular, where the variation of particular genes has been influenced by cultural traits. Uh, the, the classic example is the trait of lactase persistence. So the ability to digest milk into adulthood, which is very rare among most mammals, but fairly common, at least among some human populations, and probably most uh, certainly represents a dietary adaptation to drinking milk, um, cow's milk. So there's a cultural trait, domestication of cattle, that's influencing our diet and influencing our biological evolution. Cultural traits can also have indirect effects. So for example, um, uh, after a man and a woman get married, where they choose to reside can have an impact on mitochondrial DNA versus white chromosome diversity. So most human populations are patrilocal, meaning that after a man and a woman get married, they move to the residence, of the, they, they stay with the residence of the man. So this means that in most human societies, men are staying put where they grew, grew up, and women are moving around. And because of this, you see bigger differences between populations for the Y chromosome than for mitochondrial DNA, because the migration of women is 
there's decreasing the differences between populations for mitochondrial DNA. In matrilocal populations, which are rare, but some are known, where the men and the women move to the residence of the woman, you see the opposite effect. You see bigger differences for mitochondrial DNA than for the Y chromosome, by and large. So this residence pattern is having an indirect, but still definitive effect on patterns of human genetic variation. So as an example, then, of how we can use genetics to learn more about cultural traits, um, but what I like is where we don't actually use human genetic variation, but we use variation in a parasite of ours, namely lice. Mm. So um, humans are, are pretty much unique among animals in that we are parasitized by three different types of lice. So lice are ubiquitous. Um, you know, all mammals have lice, birds have lice, even fish have lice. But most species just have one type of lice that parasitizes them, but we have three different types. Two of those are the head louse and the body louse. So the head louse, as the name suggests, lives and feeds on the human head. And the body louse feeds on the human body, but it lives and it lays its eggs in our clothing. And that differentiation probably arose, uh, you know, that before we had clothing, we would have had one type of lice on our head. And then after we developed clothing, lice saw that as a new ecological niche. They moved into it, they evolved, they adapted to it, and they became body lice. And so if you accept that scenario, then we can use a molecular clock approach to date the divergence between head lice and body lice. And that tells us when clothing became important in human evolution. And so we did that and we got a date of around 70,000 years ago for the divergence for hum human head and body lice. And we see evidence for a strong population expansion in body lice. And so it seems that clothing probably became important in human evolution right around the time that modern humans were moving out of Africa, which I think kind of makes sense that they're moving into a, uh, from a climate which was largely warm and where they wouldn't have necessarily needed clothing to an environment which was much colder and where they probably would have needed clothing to survive. Mm -hmm. But is it possible to study uh, the evolution of, for example, languages, how they evolved and how they changed over time through genetics? So um, that's, a, I think, a trickier area. There are half studies that have been tried to do that, to look at, say, the origin of Indo-European languages and things like that. But it's, um, it's diff I think, I anyway think it's, it's difficult to make these sorts of claims with genetics, because even with ancient DNA, which has proven to be a very powerful tool and given us some very interesting new insights into the spread of different human populations, it's still basically a correlation type of analysis that you have to know a lot about the languages from what the linguists have done and what they think the time scale is and where they think the languages might have arisen. And then you can use the genetics to see if you see any sort of, of correlation in terms of population expansion at that time. Do you see um, correlation between population history and linguistic relationships or not? But we always find examples where we don't see close correlations between linguistic and genetic relationships. And that's because um, linguistic change can happen without significant genetic contact and, um, uh, and vice versa. So you can have languages moving without genes, you can have genes moving without having much impact on languages. And so it's, it's certainly interesting and useful to compare and correlate the two but you shouldn't automatically expect to find that, uh, you know, what's, that the genetic history and the linguistic histories are, are necessarily going to overlap. Mm -hmm. Right. So just taking a step back and talking again about the population or populations we evolved from in Africa, uh, are the, did these populations evolve from a single hominin species or was it multiple? Um, that's, <clears throat> a completely open question, I would say, at this time. As the, the fossil evidence gets better and better in Africa, we're finding more and more evidence of more and different, you know, types of hominins that we didn't know existed. You know, take the case of Homo naledi, which was only discovered you know, in the past few years. Um, but a completely different type of hominin that overlapped with, apparently, with uh, human ancestors in Africa. So there's all of these different hominin types. And plus, um, you know, the preservation issues are so difficult in Africa, right? People always talk about uh, East Africa or Southern Africa as being the likely places where our species evolved, but that's because that's where we have the fossils. West Africa is tropical jungle and the fossils just simply don't, don't uh, 
aren't made, aren't don't preserve there. Uh, they they disappear quite quickly under the wet humid environments, and so West Africa, I think, is just as likely a place. But um, because the fossil preservation is so poor, we simply don't know what's been going on in West Africa. And it wasn't all that long ago too that we found some of the oldest uh, potential hominin ancestors in Northern Africa, as well. You know, work that was done at our institute. So. Africa is still full of a lot of surprises, I think, and um, I don't think it's possible at this time to say how many different species might have contributed to, to African populations. There's a lot of potential candidates out there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was just thinking that before Homo sapiens, we also had other species that migrated out of Africa, like, for yes. example, Homo erectus. And I was just thinking if it was possible that at least some Homo erectus populations could have come back to Africa and then involve it to Homo sapiens, but perhaps we don't know enough about that. It's certainly possible. I think anything is possible at this point. You're right that we don't know about it. And some people have proposed that maybe there were migrations of hominins back from Asia that contributed ancestry to, to modern humans. Um, we are finding now a little bit of Neanderthal ancestry in some African populations, and that probably reflects a back to Africa migration as well. Mm -hmm. By the way, since we were able to interbreed with Neanderthals and Denisovans, for example, do they constitute different species? Because, I, I mean, one of the criteria that people use to use to distinguish between species is that uh, two different species wouldn't be able to interbreed between them. Right. So if you take a strict uh, biological species definition, like you just mentioned, if you can, if two things can interbreed, then they have to be part of the same species. And we would say that uh, you know, modern humans, Neanderthals and Denisovans, were all part of the same species. On the other hand, there are perfectly good species that people recognize, such as horses and donkeys, which can produce hybrids. So you see hybrids between what are accepted to be perfectly good species. So it's just that the, the problem is that with species, you know, humans like to put things into categories and put labels on things. And oh, the species just doesn't work that well because, again, it's a sort of continuum of what constitutes uh, different species or not. And um, sometimes our, our classic definitions don't work. So our approach, I mean, we get asked this question all the time. And our approach is to say, look, you know, we've known about Neanderthals for over a century. We have all of these remains of all of these you know, different Neanderthals that lived at all these different times. And no one can decide based on those remains whether or not they were the same species or a different species. In our view, that's not such an interesting question. The interesting question is rather to ask, what were they like? What can we learn about what they were like, how they behaved? how, you know, what sort of adaptations they had to the environment and how they interacted with modern humans and what they contributed to us. Those are the important questions, not whether or not we were the same species or not. Mm -hmm. And we're still not sure exactly why, for example, the Neanderthals went extinct. Well, there, there are some who say they didn't go extinct, right? Their DNA lives on in us. Um, but, you know, on the other hand, there are no living, breathing, 100% Neanderthals around us. So. Again, you know, there's something that genetics can't really tell us about. There are all sorts of ideas out there about why they went extinct. The one thing that genetics does indicate is that they had a pretty small effective population size, a pretty small breeding size, even smaller than modern human populations, which are also much small, already much smaller than the effective population sizes, the breeding population sizes of um, all other non-human, uh, all other apes. So. That already indicates that they were in some sort of perhaps demographic trouble, and then you layer on top of that different uh, climate change that was going on, perhaps competitive pressure from humans, perhaps there was conflict going on, we don't know. Uh, perhaps modern humans brought diseases with them that they were resistant to, that Neanderthals were susceptible to. I think that's a uh, fairly, you know, that's not an unlikely explanation. Infectious disease can be quite powerful. You just look at what happened in the uh, New World with the arrival of the Europeans, that the Native Americans arguably would have gone extinct if there hadn't been modern medicine around. So these are all possible scenarios. And at the moment with the genetics, we can't say much about those. What we can say though from the genetics, and I do like to stress this, is that you know, regardless of how different Neanderthals and, minor, and modern humans might have, we think might have appeared to one another, might have behaved or so forth, 
the product of their unions was seen as recognizably human, right? Because the children must have been brought up in modern human communities and raised in modern human communities. Otherwise, we wouldn't see their ancestry in modern human populations today. So however different we think they may have been, um, or similar they may have been, um, their children were brought up, the children of, of the uh, interbreeding that went on between modern humans and Neanderthals, were seen as modern human. Mm -hmm. So uh, earlier I have asked you about races and human populations, and I've read somewhere that we find more genetic diversity in populations within Africa than in the rest of the globe. Is that right? That is correct, and that is one of the <clears throat> strong lines of evidence that modern humans evolved in Africa and then and, and then spread out of Africa because. It's not only that we see less genetic diversity outside of Africa, but the genetic diversity we see outside of Africa is a subset of the genetic diversity we see in Africa. So in other words, Africans have everything that non-Africans have, plus some genetic variation that non-Africans don't have. And that strongly argues for an African origin. And again, we see that pattern not just in mitochondrial DNA, not just in the Y chromosome, but all across our genome. Mm -hmm. But but are there particular reasons why that happens? I mean, why is, uh, for example, our species spreads across the globe, genetic diversity decreases? So the <clears throat> the explanation that's favored for that is what's called the, uh, a movement or migration by uh, serial bottlenecks. And by serial, I mean one after another, not the breakfast mm -hmm. cereal. Okay. So the idea is that, you know, you have a population, it moves to a new area, settles there for a while, maybe a few generations, expands a bit, and then some of the people, for whatever reason, decide to move on. You know, maybe there's population pressure, maybe there's conflicts, who knows, but for whatever reason, they decide to move on. And so it's not the whole population that moves on, it's only a part of the population that moves on. And so when a part of the population moves on, they only bring part of the diversity with them, they don't bring the entire genetic diversity with them. So then they go somewhere else, and they settle there, and they expand, and then the same thing happens. Part of them decide to move on elsewhere. And so you get this expansion by uh, uh, serial bottle, what's called, what are called serial bottlenecks. So, and, and you see that, that that model fits very well to what we see in terms of human genetic diversity. As you get further and further from Africa, you see less and less diversity. So it seems that the serial bottleneck model is, is a good fit for how humans have, have migrated around the world. Mm -hmm. But is it the case that after each bottleneck we see increased diversity in that particular population? No, the, what the bottleneck does is it decreases diversity because now you have fewer people who are contributing to the next, next generation. So that results in a decrease in genetic diversity. So as you move further and further from Africa, you see this decreasing genetic diversity. Mm -hmm. Right. So uh, I've read the one paper, I think, where you were studying the Malabri. I think this is the correct way of, <laughs> yes. of, of pronouncing the name. Uh, and you were studying mtDNA diversity, mitochondrial DNA diversity within them. Could you tell us about that? Yeah, so the Malabri, are, I mean, all populations are interesting, but they're interesting for different reasons. And the Malabri are quite interesting because they're a very enigmatic group. They're known as the banana leaf people because they live in uh, northern Thailand in the in the uh, hill regions, and um, they don't have much contact. At least until recently, do not have much contact with with other people. They practice the sort of shifting agriculture where they would uh, plant crops for a few years and then move on elsewhere. And they made shelters out of these giant banana leaves. That's why they're the the banana leaf people. Um, so we study them genetically, initially with mitochondrial DNA, but later we've also done Y chromosome and genome-wide studies. They have extraordinarily low levels of genetic diversity. In fact, um, the first, uh, 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 when we got the first mitochondrial DNA results from a sample of 50 people, they all had the same mitochondrial DNA sequence, which is just, to us, was unheard of. So I immediately thought, oh, the student must have made a mistake and sequenced the the same sample 50 times, but we went back and checked, and no, it really is the case. Um, the Y chromosome, they have a little bit more diversity, but it's basically just two li major lineages, and they have extremely low levels of nuclear DNA diversity as well. And so this is an example of a profound 
uh, you know, bottleneck or founding event for this population. And it suggests, you know, one, you know, one founding female lineage, two maybe founding male lineages. And if you um, look at the little bit of diversity that they have, it would have only been produced in the past 500 to 1,000 years ago. And this fits fairly well with an origin story that not, not from the Malabri, but from a neighboring group called the Tin. Because the Tin say that, you know, in this time frame of around 1,000 years ago, um, they set uh, uh, as a sacrifice, they put a, a girl and a boy on a raft and sent them off down river. And these, these were the, the, the founding uh, family, if you will, of the Malabri. So, I mean, we have no idea if that's really how they originated or not, but clearly it was a very small number of people that contributed to the to this population. Um, and they practice, sorry, I said they practice shifting agriculture. They actually practice hunting and gathering. So that's another reason why they're of interest. They're a hunter-gatherer population in Thailand. They've recently now been switching to agriculture, but, um, and that makes them of interest because there aren't very many hunting gathering populations in, in Southeast Asia. Um, but it seems that they are derived not, and people think hunter-gatherer populations are, you know, sort of a stone age leftover from the way our ancestors used to behave before agriculture swept in. But um, in the case of the Malabri, it's probably not the case. They probably reverted from being agriculturalists because the tin are agricultural and reverted to hunting and gathering because they just didn't have the population size to sustain agriculture. And so it, it's, I think, a, a nice example of how um, you know, hunting gathering populations, we like to think that they're somehow emblematic of what our Stone Age ancestors were like. But the reality is, is this holds not just for the Malabri, but all hunter gatherer populations today have had to deal with the intrusion of agriculture. So everywhere where you have hunting gatherer populations today, they've been displaced, they've been moved out of their, their native lands, probably their lifestyle has changed as well. They've been impacted by all of this contact and, and spread of people into their, their territories. And so I think it's very questionable to say that any hunter-gatherer population today is going to be a good model for what our, our Stone Age ancestors were like. But would there be perhaps any traits where they could still be a good model for ancient hunter-gatherers or, or not at all? Uh, potentially, but like I said, it's, it's sort of an open question, right? How much they've modified their lifestyle, how much they've had to, to shift things from, from the way they used to do things. So I think this is a, an area where um, ancient DNA can be especially valuable if one can look at... Uh, um, and we are starting to get information from ancient DNA in some of these areas from uh, uh, remains that predate the arrival of agriculturalists in the area, for example. So, mm -hmm. But is, are the Malabri a good model for what might have happened to other hunter-gatherer populations in other parts of the globe? Yeah, there are this, this idea of cultural reversion is rare, but I think there are a couple of other cases uh, that have been proposed where it might have happened as well, where people might have reverted back to, to hunting and gathering for various reasons. Um, it's been s proposed to have happened in some southern African groups who are especially uh, what are called uh, Khoi-speaking groups, Khoi-Kwadi-speaking groups, who probably came actually a few thousand years ago from East Africa to Southern Africa and brought cattle with them, brought pastoralism, but then came into very difficult environmental circumstances where the cattle couldn't survive and so then had to revert to, to hunting and gathering. That's been suggested anyway. Mm -hmm. Right. So one last topic that I would like to explore here. Uh, so we've been talking about our evolutionary history, our evolutionary genetics. Uh, is it possible for us to see evolution, uh, our genetics evolving in modernity, in our modern world? Do we see any evidence of that? I would say the answer is yes. So there, I mean, there are many people who would say, oh, you know, evolution is something that happens to other species, it doesn't happen to humans because we have culture, right? And so culture is a barrier between us and biological evolution. If something happens rather than evolving biologically, we, we change our culture. But in fact, there's a lot going on that culturally we either cannot or choose not to um, respond to. And the, the, the best example of this are infectious diseases that arise. 
Right. So whenever infectious disease arises, it's a very powerful selective agent on human populations. And if we don't have the ability or the, the means or, or the will to use modern medicine to deal with these infectious diseases, then we will involve biological adaptations to them. It's happened over and over in our evolutionary past, and it's probably happening potentially even now as we speak with, um, with COVID. Um, with some of these other viruses. Malaria is, a, is the prime example. Malaria is continually, you know, probably it's in the past at least 10,000 years, it's been a strong selective force in particular regions of the world, and there are numerous biological adaptations that influence susceptibility to malaria. But any infectious disease you can think of, um, there's a propensity for um, genetic evolution in response to it. Mm -hmm. But with some of our modern tools and technologies, like, for example, what comes from medicine, is it possible that the rate of evolution is decreasing for us or, or not? Um, I would say, given that how, you know, how important infectious disease still is, uh, you know, witnessed the current pandemic, um, no, it's still a, infectious disease is still a you know, uh, a, a very strong driving force in evolution. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's end the interview here. Just before we go, would you like to mention any places on the internet where people can find your work? Uh, I would say the best starting point would be our uh, institute website. So it's got a lot of information on the work that not just we do, but all of the, the, the uh, different groups in our department who are working on different aspects of, of evolutionary anthropology or what it is that makes humans human. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. I will be leaving a link to that in the description box of the interview. And Dr. Stone King, it's been a pleasure to talk to you. Thank you for yeah. taking the time to come on the show. Thank you, my pleasure. Hi guys, thank you for watching this interview until the end. If you like what I'm doing, please consider supporting it on Patreon or PayPal. All of the links are in the description box of the interview. This show is brought to you by people like you, so consider doing it. Otherwise, and if you like the interview, please share it, leave a like and hit the subscription button. This show is brought to you by Enlights, learning and development done differently. Check their website at enlights.com. I would also like to give a huge thank you to my main patrons and PayPal supporters Karen Litzke, and Blanchett, Perga Larsen, Lau Guerrero, Francis Ford, Hans Frederick Sunda, Ricardo Vladimiro, Craig Healy, Adam Kessel, Olaf Alex, Jonathan Wiesel, Jacob Klinkby, Matthew Whittingbird, Arno Wolf, Tim Hollacy, Eric Alenia, John Connors, Pauline Barron, Philip Force Connolly, Jerry Mueller, Herbert Gintis, Rutger Voss, Bo Weingart, Rebecca Newberger Goldstein, Dan Demetri, Robert Windigan, Rui Nassio, Arthur Coe, Zup, Marco Neves, Colin Holbrook, Susan Pinker, Thomas Trumbull, Bernardo Seixas, Pablo Santurbano, Simon Colombo, Jorge Spigny, Phil Kavanagh, Corey Clark, Mark Blythe, Roberto Inguanzo, Michael Stormir, Eric Neumann, Samuel Andreev, Tiago Nunes, Bernard Yugni, Alexander Dunbauer, Omer Hickson, Fergal Cusson, Evan Bodrenko, Al Herzog, Don Ross, Jonathan Leibrand, Oslo Bullet, Nathan Nguyen, Stanton T, Samuel Correa, Eric Hines, Mark Smith, J.W. João Eira, Tom Hummel, David Sloan Wilson, Yasila Araújo. Ethan Solon, Romain Roach, Dmitry Grigoriev, Diego Londonio Correa, Tom Roff, Yannick Punter, Adan Ruzmani, Charlotte Bliss, Miran B, Nicole Barbaro, Adam Hunt, Pavel Ostazevsky, Max Belby, Nelek Bak, Catherine and Patrick Tobin, Al Ortiz. My producers is our web Jim, Frank Lucas Tafinia, Kian Gilligan, Sergio Codriano, Luis Caetano, Tom Van Egdam, Curtis Dixon, João Linhares, Benedict Mueller, Vega Gidi, Sardas France, and Niruban Balachandran. And my executive producers, Michel Rogeski, Rosie, James Pratt, and Matthew Lavender. Thank you for all.